It's Monday, which means Raw is on tonight, emanating from England, a show that I'm very much looking forward to. England is one of my favorite wrestling crowds of all time, so I'm extremely excited for tonight. If you watch this video later on in the week, hopefully you guys enjoyed the show as well. But hashtag AskGSM here today, where I answer your questions from YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, if you want to send in a question, you can leave a comment on this very video. I'll be sure to include it in next week's edition. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Leave a comment on the wall or the post I usually put up on Sunday nights when I gather the questions, or as simply put, you can tweet me on Twitter at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. If you got a good question, 99% of the time I include them in the videos because you guys are always awesome regardless. Um, but that being said, you know, without further ado, let's get started here. From the first KFC from YouTube, we'll start with the YouTube questions as always. Um, their question was, should superstars like Daniel Bryan and Dolph Ziggler just be SmackDown exclusive and rarely show up on Raw? So first and foremost, I don't know if this really has anything to do with your question, but I do want to say this. I mentioned this on Twitter last week during SmackDown, but I love the fact that SmackDown, not only in recent weeks, are kind of doing on the road to WrestleMania 2, SmackDown has kind of become the Intercontinental Championship show. Guys like Daniel Bryan and Dolph Ziggler, as you mentioned, Sheamus and Barrett and everyone else involved in the IC title picture, that's kind of their show, their, their platform to be showcased. Now, that being said, I would rather have them both appear on Raw and SmackDown because i got a few questions about the brand split, which I'll get to in a little bit. And this is just kind of a general question based off, you know, should these superstars in particular be exclusive to one show? I mean, I love the brand split. Don't get me wrong. I've done various videos here on the channel talking about how much I love the WWE draft and stuff like that. I very much miss it. Six years ago today, or was it six years? I think it was six years ago today. 2009 WWE draft. I remember watching it live on USA Network, one of my favorite nights of the year, and then they did away with it. I was very frustrated by that. I think there's a video up here in the channel right here, not in wrestling, or not on hashtag SUSM, but from WrestleRant, like April 2012, where I talked about that the draft, you know, is gone, whatever, and I did a rant up here on the channel if you guys want to check it out. It's a ways back, but uh, nevertheless, though, getting back to your question, I mean, I like the idea of a brand split, but there was, like, a rumor a couple months ago saying there was going to be, like, a soft brand split or something like that, which sounds so stupid. Um, you need to either go all in or not do it at all, and right now, um, I like the fact, I mean, it would be cool on Raw if you guys, if you got guys like Roman Reigns and John Cena and Rusev and then over on SmackDown, you have Brian and Ziggler and Ambrose and all these other guys that can shine over on SmackDown that don't really get the time to deserve more often than not on Monday Night Raw. So, I mean, I know they were, like, it was a rumor a couple of months ago that these people would be exclusive to SmackDown. Never really ended up happening. I don't think it will happen. You can't do some people exclusive to one show and then people not exclusive to others. You know what I mean? Like, maybe in a rare instance where if we had the brand split, the WWE World Heavyweight Champion could appear on both shows. Like, I'm fine with that, but... Other than that, it just didn't really make any sense. So I would not really be in favor of that, not because I don't like the brand split. I love the idea of a brand split if done properly, um, which WWE did not do in its final years, obviously. Um, so they really just can't go, you know, half seas. You know, they, they can't just go with some people exclusive to one show and then for others, you know, not applying that rule to other people. So I'm going to have to say no to that question, though I do like, like I said before, I'll get more into the brand split in just a little bit. But, um, no, I do like the fact what they're doing now, though, that, is that they showcase those people over on SmackDown. People don't watch SmackDown anymore, and, I mean, maybe if they did do that, more people would watch, but they don't treat SmackDown like an important show. So if they kept those guys on SmackDown, people are like, you know, why are all these guys, why aren't these guys on Raw? And you can't really do a brand split anyway with a three-hour Raw. It's just not going to work. You can't fill a three-hour show with just one brand. Like, when we had three-hour shows before it became a regular thing, it involved all three brands, both brands, when we had ECW, whatever. Um, so you can't really do it with just one show. But like I said, I'll get back into that a little bit later. Um, Pig Window, their question was, I know it's still a little bit far away, uh, but who do you see being this year's Mr. Money in the Bank winner? So this is always the million-dollar question, no pun intended, around this time every single year. And I always name the same people. Wade Barrett, Bad News Barrett, whatever the hell you want to call him. Cody Rhodes... And I believe I mentioned someone else last year. There's there's like three people I always go back to as potential Money in the Bank winners. And this year, I mean, someone else asked a question about Wade Barrett, and I'll get to him in a little bit. But um, I would love if Bad News Barrett kind of, they started to build him back up properly. He's been a victim of a lot of start and stop pushes over the course of his career. That goes without saying. I think a Money in the Bank run could really kind of get him back on track to where he belongs in the main event scene. Like I said, someone else asked me about that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. 
But um, still, I feel like with the Money in the Bank briefcase, I mean, it fits his gimmick, or at least it did when he was like the greedy, I'm all about the money and stuff like that. It's not really his gimmick anymore. Now he's more about bad news, obviously. So um, I don't know if that would work as well, but I would still go with him. Cody Rhodes, Stardust, I mean, Stardust, it's gotten better. I'm still not a fan. I love Cody Rhodes. I think the guy is great. He could be a top talent if they stripped him of, of the stupid, silly persona, of the stupid gimmick that's not going to go anywhere. It's Goldust 2.0. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I think he's doing a great job in the role, but the only issue that I have with it is that Cody Rhodes is capable. You know, his potential is so much higher than an undercard gimmick. Like, he had a great showing last week against John Cena, but a week later he's probably going to be losing to R-Truth or something. You know what I mean? That's just kind of the way it works. So those two would be my primary picks, as I say every single year. They're always in the match, and they never win. Um, I feel like there's someone else. I think probably Dean Ambrose, too. I don't always say him, but he's another guy that I feel should be this year's Money in the Bank winner. Um, I feel like Dean Ambrose, you know, he's a guy, like, with a Roman Reigns. I know RJ said this to me a while ago that they that he feels that Roman Reigns. I don't know if it was him or John or somebody mentioned to me that they feel that Roman Reigns might win the Money in the Bank briefcase and kind of do kind of like what they did at WrestleMania with the Roman Reigns cashing in in a, in a Rollins-Lesnar match or whatever. Um, the only issue with that is that I feel like Roman Reigns is already on that level. He shouldn't be right now, but he already is. He doesn't need a briefcase to get him back in the main event scene. That's why I wasn't really high on the idea of John Cena winning it back in 2012. He could have gotten a title shot anytime he wanted. He could have asked CM Punk for one. He would have granted him it. You know, the briefcase just felt like a waste. Um, when you could use it to elevate a star like a Seth Rollins or an Edge or a Miz, a Punk, whoever. Um, so yeah, I feel like Ambrose would be the perfect candidate because he he belongs in the main event scene. But right now he's not really doing anything. So it's not like he can you know right off the bat contend for the World Heavyweight Championship. He needs that extra boost, and I feel like a Money in the Bank run. You know, in which he should have won last year against Rollins. I mean, obviously, it ended up working out well for Seth Rollins. But um, I feel, at least for Dean Ambrose, that briefcase can kind of... Um, he can use that briefcase in, in taking the next step towards that world championship. So, Ambrose, Barrett, Rhodes are my pick. Anyone but Roman Reigns, pretty much. Not because they don't like Roman Reigns or John Cena or whoever... Those guys don't need the briefcase. They can already contend for the World Heavyweight Championship. That's what some people don't really tend to get sometimes. I don't. It's not my hate for these people. It's just because they don't really need that briefcase. They can already contend for that World Championship. Same thing with a, a Big Show or a Kane or a Orton or whoever. You know what I mean? Um, but regardless, though, I feel like those are my primary picks. I hate to repeat myself, but those are my picks for this year's Money in the Bank briefcase winners. Um, Andre G, moving into the Facebook questions. One of two here. He's got a few questions. Uh, first one being, what are your thoughts on New Day beginning to turn heel? I think it's long overdue, obviously. Um, I mean, these guys should have been healed from the get-go. Uh, I mean, I don't understand why it took them this long to finally turn them. I'm just happy they're doing it. I'm not going to bitch and moan and say, oh, you know, they should have been healed from the get-go. And I mean, I am. <laughs> basically, I'm doing that right now, as everyone is. Um, but I mean, I'm just glad. I'm appreciative of the fact they're finally coming to their senses and turning them heel. The only issue with turning them heel is that I'm not, you know, against it or anything, but I feel like if they're going to turn them heel, they need to scrap the New Day bullshit. Like, though, over the top, you know, happy go lucky bullshit they've been doing since they debuted. It's not going to work. Like, that's why Adam Rose flopped as the heel face tween or whatever the fuck he is right now. Um, you know, because he started becoming a heel, but he never really changed his persona. Sure, he pushed a bunny every once in a while. But aside from that, his gimmick did not really change. He came out still doing the party thing. I feel like with the New Day, it's not going to become heat for them. People aren't just going to care. You know, I think all three guys have said this time and time again. All three guys are incredible athletes. They're not like world championship material, but they're all really, really good. And I feel like if you push them in an aggressive manner, that kind of glimpse of a heel Kofi, a heel Biggie, and a heel Xavier that we saw when they first joined forces for the very first time beyond this New Day bullshit um, last summer, I thought was great. And if they were going to go in that direction, stay serious, have Xavier be the mouthpiece, it would be amazing. So hopefully they go in that direction. They won't keep on doing the you know, the happy-go-lucky, it's a new day shit, because it's it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I'm telling you right now. Um, next question of his, um, he says, where does BNB, Bad News Barrett, go after Extreme Rules, move up to the main event scene, or stay in the mid-card? So I just got done talking about this, but and I wrote an article about this last week on HiddenRemote.com, if you want to go back and check it out, cheap plug. I think Bad News Barrett is the most misused superstar 
in WWE today, I know you can say, now I've answered this question here on the show before, you could say Cesaro or even Emma, but I feel like with Barrett, the thing, I mean, it's different because Emma's a woman, she's in the Divas Division, whatever. Barrett, it's a lot different because I feel like, you know, Cesaro could be a world champion too, but at least he's doing something right now. At least he's in an entertaining tag team with Tyson Kidd and he's holding gold. And even, Bar even though Barrett was Intercontinental Champion, he was booked so shitty. And that reign didn't mean anything, he didn't mean anything. So it was a complete waste of time. So, that being said, um, I think, you know, would I like to see him move up to the main event scene? Absolutely, that's where he belongs. He's belonged there since day one, since he came into the company. Back in 2010, he was contending for the title in the main event of pay-per-views. By the end of that year, and then he would... Go back to the WWE title scene. He would go down in the undercard. Like, it's been very, very up and down the card for Barrett over the last five years. I think he deserves better. But if I had to take a guess, he's probably going back down to the mid card. Like, I had that same hope about a year or so ago, or two years, excuse me, when he was Intercontinental Champion, when he won it back from, like, the Miz, which was a waste because he never did anything with the belt after that. But he dropped the championship to Curtis Axel in that triple threat match with Miz at Payback. And I'm thinking, okay, this is a perfect opportunity for him to leave the mid-card finally, finally be pushed properly, and win the Money in the Bank briefcase, and that obviously didn't happen. They gave it to Damian Sandow instead, which, as much as I love Damian Sandow, that was pretty much a waste as well, because he lost every match that he had. He had a great showing against John Cena, but the aftermath was botched. But um, I digress. With Barrett, I feel like he is worthy of being a main event guy. I just don't have hope at this point that they're going to do it properly, especially with only one world championship. If we still have the World Heavyweight Championship, I'd maybe be a little bit more hopeful that they would finally do something with him and finally push him towards the world title scene. But with only one undisputed championship... And with so many top-tier players right now, you have your Daniel Bryans and your Roman Reigns, Randy Orton, John Cena, you know, all these other guys. There's no place for him right now in the main event scene, regardless of whether he deserves to be there or not. So he'll probably stay in the mid-card. I mean, I think a match or a feud with Neville, I think, would be really, really cool. Neville needs that establishing feud. I mean, I know Bear does not mean much right now. But it's better than Neville squashing like Fondango or even Axel. I feel like Barrett does have some credibility still attached to his name. And a feud with him can kind of take Neville to uh, to new heights in WWE. So I would love to see that feud coming out of Extreme Rules. Um, his next question, what do you see Jason Jordan's career being like in WWE? So Jason Jordan, I mean, I know that name might not ring a lot of bells for some people. Of course, the former tag team partner of Ty Dillinger in NXT. Of those two, I always really liked Ty Dellinger more. I don't know what it was. I mean, some people compare the two to Charlie Haas and, World, and uh, Shelton Benjamin and the world's greatest tag team. You know, race aside, I mean, with Jason Jordan being, you know, African-American and being the, like Aiken and Shelton and Ty Dellinger looking like Charlie Haas, whatever. Um, but, you know, you know, the skin color aside, the two were a great tag team. And I can see where those comparisons made from. Um, they just didn't really have the chemistry that Benjamin and Haas did. That was the only issue. And I think Ty Dillinger, seeing from what, you know, seeing from his work, you know, all the way back in ECW, back in like 08, 09, whatever it was, before he got cut, before, you know, all the way to the point when he first came in NXT a couple years ago, I think in like 2013 or something like that. You know, the guy's always been a jobber, but he has showed some personality on some levels at times, and the guy can be really, really good as a heel, I think. I've seen some kind of glimpses of him on the indie scene in NXT where I think he is really, really good. Jason Jordan, to me, doesn't scream charisma as much as Ty Dillinger does. He's an impressive athlete. I think he has a re amateur wrestling background. And I think he's in some stable right now called The Shoot Nation, which has yet to make its debut on TV, um, which is good. I mean, I feel like that would be good for him. If he can, and not the next nation of domination, but like an amateur wrestling, you know, a shoot wrestling background, I think with those three guys, it would be really, really cool. I don't think NXT has any stables right now aside from Cassidy... Um, Cassidy and Moore and Carmella. So I think those three guys can be a great uh, kind of an act, a great faction on NXT if they're going to go that route. So I don't think he's going to be like the next world champion or anything. I don't. I don't see him. I don't see him right now as being an NXT champion. But I would love to see him prove me wrong. Like I said, the guy's an impressive wrestler. He's an impressive athlete. But in terms of superstardom, charisma, having that it factor, he doesn't scream that to me personally. I think Ty Dillinger was better, and they're. Um, if they don't do anything with Ty Dillinger, I'd be really disappointed, and hopefully they um, they can do something with him, as well as Jason Jordan. Like I said, he's not a complete lost cause, but um, he's going to need to prove his worth to me anyway. I feel like he is good. I'm not shitting on the guy, but he needs to have that it factor in order to make it in NXT and in WWE. 
Speaking of NXT, his next question was, um, who do you see beating Kevin Owens for the NXT Championship? So this was not my idea. I was listening to the Solo Monster Sounds Off, an amazing podcast. Listen to it every single week. This was his idea, so I don't want to rip him off. But um, yeah, he said this in his podcast, actually just yesterday, and I heard this, and I thought it was a great idea, that they build up Hideo Itami to beat Kevin Owens for that NXT Championship, and that's finally when he hits the GTS. Like, that would be an amazing sight. I know he hit it at the live event right before WrestleMania, but that wasn't televised, of course. I mean, I know they showed it in the Hideo Itami special last week in NXT, but he has yet to hit it in, like, Full Sail University and a big match, whatever. So that would be great if they can, you know, have him finally be, you know, have him be the one to beat Owens, give him his first singles loss in WWE, beat him for that belt, and then Owens goes up to the main roster. I think that'd be great. Um, you know, Finn Balor would be another likely candidate, but I mean, Balor could be on Raw as soon as tonight, from what I'm hearing anyway. So that would be really, really cool, but I feel like Balor will be on the main roster sooner rather than later. I did put out a tweet last week saying he'll probably be the first one called up after WrestleMania next year, and a lot of people gave me heat for that because they think it's going to be a lot sooner, and I think it will be too, but I don't know. I just had this gut feeling they're going to keep on delaying it and delaying it and delaying it like they did with Sami Zayn. And who someone else asked a question about that, which I'll get to pretty soon. But uh, Hideo Tommy, I think, would be the perfect candidate to be the one to beat Owens for the NXT Championship. Sami Zayn, I mean, sure, would it be cool if he beat him for the belt when whatever? Yeah, that'd be nice and all, and they could have a really good match in the next special whenever it ends up happening. But um, I feel like Sami Zayn needs to be up the main roster ASAP. He should have been up there the night after WrestleMania, and I'll get to why that wasn't in a second. But um, So it shouldn't be Sami Zayn, or maybe Finn Balor, but like I said, I feel like he will be main roster bound sooner rather than later. Hideo Tommy, I think, is the perfect candidate. The guy really you know, turned a lot of heads with that NXT special last week. A lot of people said he would never make it. You know, WWE has a track record for not really pushing, prominently featuring Japanese stars like Tajiri and all these other guys from the last couple of years. Yoshitatsu, kind of giving them goofy gimmicks. I'm hoping Hideo Tommy will be the exception. The guy is really, really good. He's a great wrestler, and he has charisma, too, and I feel like, you know, it, with time, as as more as he gets used to the WWE style, he will become more of a star in WWE. So I would love to see him be the one to beat Kevin Owens for the NXT Championship. Next question, or next set of questions, come from Paul S., also from Facebook. First question being, who would you be, who would be the most logical one to win the next Money in the Bank briefcase? Like I said before, I um, already answered this, but either, I mean, Barrett or Rhodes wouldn't necessarily be logical. It would be more shocking, but I think they deserve it the most. Logical, Roman Reigns, like I said, I can see where that kind of makes sense, but it shouldn't happen. Um, I don't want to see it happen. I mean, who else in the roster right now? I guess you can go with, like, a Dean Ambrose, like I said. I think Dean Ambrose would be the perfect candidate. And if he cashes in, instead of taking the opportunistic route, he cashes in at SummerSlam against Ro against <clears throat> against Seth Rollins or at some B pay-per-view. And you can do that match again. Maybe he beats him for the belt. I don't know. But I think that'd be really, really cool. So, um, yeah, like I said before, Barrett Ambrose or Cody Rhodes, Stardust, whatever you want to call him. His next question, with Samoa Joe likely to come to the WWE, do you suppose AJ Styles would one day make it as well? So I've talked about this before, and I don't think so, unfortunately. I mean, I was listening to some shoot interview that he did, um, I think in the start of last year, right after he left TNA, and he was saying that WWE didn't even contact the guy when he left TNA, which I think is ridiculous. I think AJ Styles is among, like, I know, like, hands down, I know this is the bold statement, but maybe not really. But uh, the guy is among the best wrestlers in the world right now. And, I mean, maybe Samoa Joe is only in there. And, I mean, they have a track record, WWE, that is, for not really picking up on former TNA people. I know there's the Austin Kongs and the Chris Harrises. And Austin Kong did not succeed, not because of WWE's failed booking, but because she got pregnant. So it was terrible timing. And then Chris Harris just wasn't in any shape. He wasn't good. And they put him right on ECW. So he wasn't going to succeed at all. But, um... You know, aside from those, and it's Sting, but fucking Sting, you know, it's Sting, so there's really no justifying that one. Um, you know, RVD, same case, and stuff like that, Ric Flair. But, um, you know, aside from those people, there really aren't many ex-TNA guys that are in WWE or have gone to WWE, gone back to WWE, and have succeeded. K-Quick, R-Truth, Christian, both those guys were in WWE before, so that's why they landed a job back in WWE, so I, I don't really count them. But, um, yeah, that's why, I don't know, I think AJ Styles, in his case, he has more of a stench of TNA on him. And Samoa Joe, the same can be said for him. The guy was with the company for not three or four years. The guy was there for, like, almost a decade, almost exactly. So, you know, I think with him anyway, Triple H is more for, uh, of a proponent of his. And I read some report, which was comical, because it was so obvious, 
that there were three people that are in charge of making decisions between Kevin Owens, Kevin Owens, um, Kevin Dunn, Mr. McMahon, Vince McMahon, and Triple H. And two of those three were not really high on signing Samoa Joe, and one really was. So I guess you can kind of put two and two together and say that Triple H was the one that was the most in favor of bringing in Samoa Joe. And, I, and it's not really difficult to see why the guy's an amazing talent. Should have been there years ago when he was still in his prime and in better shape, but it is what it is. If I'm able to see Samoa Joe in WWE NXT at all, it's going to be phenomenal. I cannot wait for that. Once you know, Especially after guys like Coven Owens go up and Hideo Itami and Finn Balor and stuff like that. But um, No, I don't really see AJ Styles going to WWE. I think there's a chance. I know he's kind of old, but then again, guys like Kenta and <clears throat> Kevin Owens and guys like that, the, the, you know, that whole trio of guys they signed last year, Owens, Atami, and Bloor, all three guys, I believe, are in their 30s. And I know AJ Styles is like mid-30s, maybe higher 30s. I'm not exactly sure. But, um, you know, the guy's among the best in the world. To not even give him a call is one thing. I mean, that was a bit ridiculous. So they could have at least, you know, considered bringing him in. I feel like he would be great in WWE, but... You know, a case can be made that their roster is pretty stacked right now. He would get lost in the shuffle, you know, on and on and on. So I understand that argument. Maybe that's why they don't want to bring him in. I'm not really sure. But, you know, it would be cool to see him in WWE. I would mark the hell out. I unfortunately just do not see it happening because um, if they were going to sign him, they would have started talking to him a year ago when he left TNA. And that is an, unfortunately, a year and a half later, he looks like, you know, he's really enjoying himself on the, you know, on the indie circuit in Japan with New Japan, New Japan Pro Wrestling. So, um, you know, I don't really see a problem with him, um, you know, staying there and not coming to WWE. If he's happy, that's really all that matters. As much as I love AJ Styles, I just honestly do not see it happening. I'd love to see them prove me wrong, though. I didn't think Samoa Joe would go to WWE. 90% confirmed that he's pretty much there. So, glad to see them proving me wrong. Next question of Paul's. Um, do you think a Mordecai, a.k.a. Kevin Furtig, um, Undertaker match would have sold well? Probably not. I mean, I know there was like a string of guys from like 04 to like 08 where they were building them up for the Undertaker and it just didn't come to fruition. I know there was that Vade Hansen guy, I think his name was. He had that weird like one vignette, an episode of SmackDown in like late 08. Freaked the fuck out of me. Um, you know, there was that and... Uh, you know, Mordecai, like you said, too, the guy just wasn't that great. I know, like, as Kevin Thorne, the guy was a good athlete and all, but the Mordecai gimmick was so over the top and so stupid, it's not really surprising to me to, to, to understand, to see that it didn't really have a very long shelf life because the character was only going to go so far. And it's no secret that he was being groomed for a run with The Undertaker and that obviously after they saw the character botched, wasn't getting over whatever, whatever. Um, they scrapped it. So, like I said, not really hard to see why. Um, would it have sold well? Would the feud have been nice? It probably would have been, you know, typical Undertaker gimmickry stuff, gimmicky stuff, whatever. And the match probably would have bombed. I mean, I know Undertaker, you know, one of the greatest of all time. Respect the fuck out of the guy. But in terms of having great matches with guys like Kali, I know Kali's like in the league all of his own. But, you know, guys like Heidenreich and Mordecai, not Mordecai, but, you know, that whole string of matches, A-Train and Big Show, their matches were just never really that good, you know? So, a uh, big boss man, too. So, I don't think the match... The match would not have been good. Would the feud have sold well? Maybe. I mean, I guess we'll never really know. But um, the match itself, I think, is would have, would have sucked. I think the match would not have been good. So, I'm glad that did not ultimately come to fruition. Justin G., his Facebook questions include, um, Looking back into the history of past championship titles that were brought within the WWF, WWE, I love the hardcore belt that follow, the most, followed by the European and light heavyweight. Which title would you like to see come back into the fold, even if it was a, for a short period of time? So, in an ideal scenario, in a, in, in a perfect world, I would not bring back any championships. I know that question or that answer might surprise some people. I'm of the mindset that we don't need more titles. If anything, we need less. Like, I would not be opposed at all to them merging the mid-card championships. Like, a couple of years ago, I was fully against the idea of them merging the world championships, but... Slowly but surely, you know, all those titles started to mean a lot less. And you can't tell me that the WWE World WWE Championship means now, means less than it did, you know, two or three years ago when we only had that title and then a world title. Without the brand split, it doesn't make any sense. So we needed only one world champion. So that being said, to answer your question, if I had to choose a championship to bring back, I know I've said this before, but I love the hardcore title. And part of that may be due to the fact that of the time in which it was around, you know, the attitude, you have to take that into consideration. 
And a lot of the stuff they did around that time, like, you know, the women, the men beating up the women and whatever, whatever, the creativity surrounding the Attitude Era will never be replicated. So I don't think they would, you know, capture that same magic if they were able, if, if they were to do it again, you know, with the 24-7 rule. And I'm not even a huge hardcore fan. Like I said before, like, I'm not a fan of TNA doing hardcore matches every single week. So, um, yeah, I think the hardcore title to be brought back for a short period of time anyway would be really, really cool. Light heavyweight, I mean, I'd rather see the cruiserweight title back that has more of a lineage attached to it, lineage. Um, just the, the amount of cruiserweights they have, it's not as ideal or probable as it was... You know, even a year ago when I answered that question, it could WWE have a cruiserweight division? Get it all the time, but the chance of it happening, you know, just less than and less. And I would say, you know, it's a great, you know, network exclusive show. But with guys like uh, Yoshitatsu gone and Evan Bourne and Neville, the guy, I mean, Neville would be perfect for the division, but he's capable of so much more. Um, so I wouldn't really bring back that championship. And the European belt was just kind of a... The Terry Terry title, I guess. I always botch that and how you pronounce it. But um, that was just around because they had a huge roster and they needed more titles. So um, that was m primarily the reason why they had that around for most of the Attitude Era. But um, of those championships, of any championship to be brought back, I'd probably bring back the uh, the Hardcore Belt. I mean, I know it doesn't really count. I'd bring back the Women's Championship over the Divas Championship personally. But um, we're not really talking about making belts over, you know, giving a belt a makeover. We're just, um, you know, uh, fantasizing and what championships to bring back. So maybe the hardcore belt for maybe like a month or so. I don't know. A 24-7 rule. I would love to see I would love to see how that would play out in 2015. Probably not too well, but I would love to see what they can come up with, you know, with guys in the current roster like a Dean Ambrose and Luke Harper and maybe a Stardust. You know, all these crazy people um, that we have in the roster right now. Them competing for that championship would be pretty awesome, I have to admit. His next question, in 2006, the ECW brand was revived with an invasion angle. Do you think as it is, or is it quite possible that we will have another ECW invasion? Absolutely not. I mean, maybe this is just me, because, you know, I didn't grow up, obviously, during the Attitude Era, and, you know, around the time that ECW was hot in the late 90s of whatever, whatever. But, um... You know, I've seen this with other people that did grow up in that time and do share the same sentiments as me, and that the ECW shit has been done to death. I have nothing against ECW. Love the, I love the industry. I love the uh, company, of course. I went back and watched a few pay-per-views on the network. So much fun to watch. But then again, I mean, you know, when they did it in 06, I get it. They're gonna make the, they're gonna redo the brand again. One Night Stand for the few shows they did it were awesome. One of my favorite pay-per-views I've ever seen, quite honestly. Um, in like 05 and 06, I thought those pay-per-views were kick-ass. And then TNA did it, and then they did a whole faction, and it bombed, and all these other companies are doing it. They're still trotting like Tommy Dreamer out there, and I love Tommy Dreamer to death. Anyone that has watched like my video blogs and stuff like that, um, you know, we met a couple times in the past, but I mean, the ECW Invasion Ankle, to do it again would be a complete waste. They've been doing it to death for how many years now, you know, 10, 15 years, and it never really gets any more entertaining because it's always the same thing. And all the ECW originals, anyway, are broken down. They really have no business being in the current state of the company with so many young guys and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, to do another ECW invasion angle would be just ridiculous. I am done with the ECW reunions, invasions, and shit like that. If you want to trot out an ECW guy out there, like every once in a while, like when they're in Philly, you want to put Tommy Dreamer on the car like they did, they did at the uh, 2012 Slammy Awards, or a Bubba Ray in Philadelphia, or an RVD in Philadelphia, like stuff like that, I'm absolutely open to. I think for a one-off, it's great. An invasion angle, been there, done that, much less with ECW guys, does not need to happen. Um, his last question, speaking of invasion angles, um, I was watching the WWF Invasion pay-per-view just a few days ago, and I loved... WWE versus WCW, but I also have hope that the brand split will return. Do you think that we will see a Raw invasion on a SmackDown show ever again, or is the WWE set and will stay with one big roster? So, like I've said about the brand split in the past, and you know, you know, just earlier on in this video, it's not completely out of the question that we'll, you know, that we'll get it again. I feel like at some point, maybe when the when the timing is right, when the roster is right, we have enough top-tier players where they can't squeeze everyone up in the main event scene and we need two titles again, whatever. Um, I think it'd be great. I think that'd be the best way to conduct business. 
you know, for both Raw and SmackDown. And SmackDown hasn't meant anything since the brand split died. You know, people will say it hasn't meant anything since, like, 03, but I feel like SmackDown, in my opinion anyway, was still pretty good. You know, in its final years of the brand split, you know, dating all the way back to Orton Christian's feud in 2011, SmackDown has not been must-see since then, in my opinion anyway. So, that being said... Um, is there a chance of it ever happening again? The brand split anyway? Yeah, I think there, <clears throat> there's a chance. Not a very big chance, but, um, you know, never say never. I know it's a cliche in the wrestling industry, but never say never in terms of a uh, brand split being brought back. But an invasion? I mean, what can you really do? It's not like Raw can invade SmackDown because there's no two rosters anymore. You know what I mean? You see, you can't really do an invasion. The way that I would see it happening, and I talked about this with John, like, Two or three years, uh, two or three years ago, and we're still very much on the same page about this. I don't know if he still feels the same way, but I know I do. In that, you just do what you didn't know too. You know, you just hold the draft with two separate GMs, McMahon and Flair, back in '01 or two, I think it was. And then, you know, in 2015, you do I don't know Paul Heyman and somebody else. And then, or Stephanie over on SmackDown, you know, Paul Heyman on Raw, Stephanie on SmackDown, like the good old days. Um, I would be absolutely in favor of that. I think that'd be awesome. And then you just select your superstars. You know, I pick John Cena, whoever. You know, I love the random shuffle. Why not? Obviously, it was not random or whatever. It was, you know, predetermined. And sometimes the superstars didn't even know. Um, but that said, though, I feel like, you know, that whole setup, that whole format of the draft back in 08 through 20, or I think it was 2005 in which they started, like, the random drawings. Um, from 05 to 2011 when they did it, I thought it was like one of the best nights of the year. I thought it was so exciting because um, even though it was predetermined, some moves were more predictable than others, it was still a lot of fun to watch. So, um, you know, I would be in favor of them bringing back the brand split, like I said, if done properly. Completely out of the question? Absolutely not. You can't do an invasion angle, but like I said, doing something like a, you know, two GMs being selected and just kind of picking the rosters, you know, like in the NFL, whatever. Um, you know, in other sports, like where, where it's realistic, you're not randomly driving superstars or wrestlers, athletes, whatever. Um, I think that'd be great and probably would be the best way to go about it. At the average grunt, he sent in these questions last week, the first of three being, um, should the Intercontinental and U.S. and Tag Team titles become genderless? By that, I mean, should Divas be able to compete for them, too? So I know Lucha Underground does that. Currently, they have men wrestling the women, which I think is cool. I mean, I know Jim Ross, and listening to his podcast, he's not very fond of that idea. He didn't. He doesn't think it's believable, and I understand that. But um, I don't know. I think it's something new and innovative that you don't really see. I probably it is you know ingrained in the Lucha Libre culture. I'm just not too familiar with Lucha Libre enough to the point where I would know that, that they do it constantly. Um, but in Lucha Underground, anyway, one of the top promotions right now, I mean, obviously underneath WWE and such, but um, with them anyway, I feel like it's unique to those guys. And they're not doing it, I mean, sometimes it's a little over the top when you see Sexy Star versus Big Rick, a.k.a. Ezekiel Jackson. Like, in that aspect, like, that's a little bit too much. But when you put her up against people that are her size and sometimes a little bit bigger then it's cool. I think it's really, really awesome. And it has to be the right women, too. Like, Lucha Underground is not WWE. Like, in Lucha Underground, you have Eva Luce and Sexy Star and, you know, like, those kind of girls who could go with the guys. And I'm not saying that any of the women can't in WWE. I feel like absolutely Paige could, um, maybe even Naomi. And, like, the prominent players right now, the Pages, the Natalias, who has mixed it up with the guys in the past, maybe the Bella Twins, but can you honestly see, like, a Rosa Mendez versus, like, you know, whoever, Adam Rose or something, they'd be squashed in a minute because they're not any good. They don't have any credibility, you know what I mean? So, um, no, I'm not really in favor of them making those championships genderless. I mean, I think it's cool to do it in Lucha Underground. I think it's awesome. It's something innovative to them. But in WWE, just treat the women properly, you know? Just give them, you know, showcase their skills. Don't completely shit on them and treat them like garbage. I feel like there's a lot of potential there they're not tapping into. But uh, you don't need to make the championships genderless. You don't need to do guy versus girl because it's not like we would see in the Attitude Era when you would see people being put through tables. I can't even remember the last time you had a girl getting hit by a guy in WWE TV. It's been a long ass time. Um, at least a couple of years. I can't remember the last time that was even the case. So you know that they're never going to do something like that. Should it happen? No. Will it happen? Probably not. Um, but you know, like I said, I feel like in some cases it would be fine. Like I know We've had guy and girl matches before, like very, very rarely, but it was never like anything competitive. It wasn't for a championship or anything. I know we had, I'm trying to think, I don't know, like 
AJ versus maybe Daniel Bryan or something like that. I don't know, like comedy matches and stuff like that. And like Beth Phoenix versus like uh, Santino from like 2008. And that was a comedy. That was more of an angle than it was a competitive matchup. Like stuff with that I'm fine with, but taken seriously, like some of the women I can't, like I could see Paige beating up half the guys or a fucking, I don't know, an awesome Kong in TNA, but aside from that, or a, you know, like a China or whoever, um, I could see those kind of girls going up against the guys, but for the most part, it's not the brightest idea, in my opinion. I like the idea, but it's probably not the most plausible. Um, his next question, what's your favorite or least favorite pay-per-view set design? And he didn't want me to say anything from the current day, considering how the fact that we don't have really pay-per-view sets anymore. But, um... I mean, I don't really have a favorite or least favorite. I mean, I know you said not to say it, but I mean, the pay-per-view sets now are just kind of depressing. I mean, it's just kind of the standard set. Same thing even with Raw and SmackDown. I mean, I know people, you know, say that both shows need to have their own separate identities, and they, that needs to start with the look of the show. They have separate graphics and stuff, separate theme songs, but the sets themselves are essentially the same, and it would be a lot better if they kind of established their own identity for both shows. So, um, anyway, I can't really think of a least favorite. I think there's been, like, I mean, in watching old pay-per-views on the network and stuff, there's been a lot of great pay-per-view sets. Um, favorite? I mean, WrestleMania is always amazing, so I probably have to go to WrestleMania. But Money in the Bank, too, I mean, I know they had, I don't, I don't know if they do it anymore, of course, but, um, the, uh, you know, the, the money truck or whatever it was, the, 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 the car that they would have on the side, like, where they transport money in and stuff, the, the name of it is escaping me right now, but you know what I mean, if you play the games and WWE 2K15, 14, whatever, you know what I'm talking about, they show that stage and the car in the background, the set from, like, Money in the Bank 2011 is what I'm thinking of, um, I love that set, I thought that was pretty cool, I'm trying to think of other sets that were, I thought, like, from my time, were like, wow, that's amazing, like, TLC, when they would hang the chairs and stuff, I thought that was really, really cool, so that, those would probably be among my favorite. Lee's favorite, there really isn't in, there really isn't one aside from the stuff that we get today. Because most of the pay-per-views, if they have a unique set, I'm cool with it. Like the Royal Rumble, you know, for the last couple of years, there's been no real unique set aside from them just running out, which is pretty depressing, to be quite honest with you. I feel like for the bigger pay-per-views, they should kind of go above and beyond and delivering an amazing set, but whatever. Um, so yeah, favorite sets, probably WrestleMania, Money in the Bank, and TLC from back in the day anyway, because currently they don't do that anymore, and least favorite, the current ones. Like I said, you told me not to say that, but there's really no other least favorite sets to choose from that I didn't like hate or anything like that. Um, and his final question, should Sting have a match at SummerSlam, and if so, who should he fight against? So it's interesting that you, br that you bring this up. I mean, we talked about this on WrestleRant Radio last week. Imagine, like, Sting challenged John Cena to the U.S. Championship. Um, like that, something like that would be cool. I don't see it happening at all, but I think it would be awesome though, considering Sting's um, connection to that title and whatever else. We don't even know if Sting's gonna wrestle again. I would assume so, but I, but I mean, he didn't really give anything away, pretty much. In that post WrestleMania promo last a uh, couple weeks ago, the night after WrestleMania on the WWE Network, he did not give us any indication as far as what's next. I would assume there's gonna be one more match with him, probably against the Undertaker next year. That that's the only thing that makes sense right now. Um, so I'd probably go with, um, just him wrestling at WrestleMania. There's no reason for him to compete at SummerSlam unless the match was right. A John Cena, if he was going to wrestle at SummerSlam, John Cena would be the best bet, especially if he was doing the U.S. Open Challenge. Who wins? I mean, does Sting lose two matches in a row? Does Sting win the belt and then vacate it? I don't know what you would do in that instance, but it'd be a big time fucking money matchup if they wanted to go that route. Um, so John Cena, there's not many guys that Sting can face, though. Sting isn't like The Rock and that I would like to see him work with younger guys. Like, a match with him and Dolph Ziggler or Daniel Bryan doesn't really interest me all that much, to be quite honest with you. Sting is a guy, and he said this before, that works well with people from his era. Whether it be Triple H or Cena or whoever, or um, The Undertaker, of course. Those three people, I mean, no, I know John Cena is not from his era, but he's a top-tier guy. He's an established name. It makes sense from a financial business standpoint, whatever. Um, a Bray Wyatt would be a cool match, too, but the only issue I see with that is that both guys just lost at WrestleMania, so why is there a need for a match between those two? You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like, both guys need wins right now, so putting them up against each other is not the best course of action. I mean, I know it's a complete repeat from WrestleMania, and SummerSlam is not WrestleMania, but Bray Wyatt should be on the winning end of his next feud, so putting him against Sting, only for him to lose would not be the best idea, but um, I don't see him wrestling at SummerSlam, but if he did... John Cena would be a good opponent, but I, like I said before, I'd probably 
put money on him, seeing him next around WrestleMania time next year, or at least wrestling another match at WrestleMania. Now that be it for him. Um, at Reborn again, his question was, uh, moving into the Twitter questions, or the, the average grunts was the start of the Twitter questions, but at Reborn again, his question was, um, who do you feel was the worst world or WWE champion of all time? I've talked about this before, but definitely the Great Khali or Jack Swagger. It's hard to say, like, the worst WWE champions. Because, like, do you call Rey Mysterio holding the belt for, like, you know, an hour, the worst title holder of all time? You know, like, stuff like that, it's hard to say. Um, I would, you know, give him a decent reign or whatever, like, something like that. Um, WWE champion, I'd go with, like, Del Rio for the first few times that he held it. That was a complete waste of time. And then for the world championship, like you said on Twitter, like, yeah, you know, there's really no doubt about it, but great Kali. Um, that's pretty much a gone given an answer considering the fact he was a terrible wrestler the only reason why they did it was the fact you know they wanted to you know get that market over in india happy which i get it i get it they have a big following over in india they wanted to please them you know make some money over there maybe they did some touring that summer um, i can't tell you i wasn't a fan of the time but um that's the only reason why they did it and they never pushed the guy after that so what was the point you know so um with, uh, I, I, I probably have to go with Kali. At least with Jack Swagger, as terribly booked as he was, his matches were still halfway decent. Like the four way at Fatal Four Way, or even the match with Randy Orton Extreme Rules, in which he won clean, were really, really good. Kali's matches sucked. He didn't put anyone over. He held the title for like two or three months, and it was a complete waste of time. So, um, yeah, I'd probably have to go with Great Kali in that answer, in that question, for that question. At Big Bird 432, their question was, um, when do you think would be the best possible time to debut Sami Zayn on the main roster? So I said time and time again, like the night after WrestleMania along with Adrian Neville, but it just obviously was not the case. Maybe it's because he was injured, he was originally supposed to go up, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but I know he's clear to compete now, so whenever they want to bring him up, you know, Time is of the essence, I feel like, because um, you know, he's been down there for almost two years. The guy should be up there right now. So that being said, I feel like the best possible time to do it, probably by the summertime. I don't want to see them wait another year until you know the night after WrestleMania next year. I mean, with Finn Balor, I get it. I mean, I know the guy's ready now, and if he comes up, I'll, I'll be super psyched. But with Sami Zayn, anyway, the guy's been down there by next WrestleMania three fucking years. Like, that's way too long. Um, he's already won the championship, so probably after he gets his rematch, and the timing works out, too. So if he gets his rematch at, um, at whatever the next special is, I don't know, I don't think they called it anything yet. They haven't officially announced the name for the next event. Um, in May, I know it's on May 20th, so he cashes in his rematch clause at that event, loses in a triple threat or one-on-one -on -one match or whatever, and then he wins, you know, he goes on to debut on the main roster a month or so later, much like the Wyatt family, like when they debuted in the summer of 2013, I could see Sami Zayn debuting, like, right after whatever the June pay-per-view is, and or Money in the Bank, I think, is the June show, or right after Battleground in July, something around those lines. I feel like the summer would be the best possible time. He's done everything there is to do in NXT. And he already won the championship, so now is the time to bring him up. And after he uses up his rematch, does the rematch with Owens, then it's time for him to go up. So like I said, best possible time, probably right in the, uh, right at the start of the summer. Um, so in June or July. Um, next question of his, or from at Daniel Cabeza 59 In your opinion, who is the best technical wrestler of all time? There's probably going to be a couple answers for this. I'd probably have to go with Bret Hart, though. I think he is the best technical wrestler of all time. Very subjective. I mean, who is the greatest... Um, talker of all time. like Stuff like that is very subjective. In my opinion, anyway, Bret Hart. Um, so I'd probably have to go with Bret Hart. You know, there's always, like, the the other guys that aren't as notable, like the Dean Malenko's and, um, you know, people like that, I feel like, would also be top-tier candidates to consider for best technical wrestlers. But Or even a Ric Flair, but I feel like he was more of a, uh, of a showman than he was. I mean, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, absolutely, but he was also a great, amazing showman. So is Bret Hart. So probably Rick, uh, Ric Flair or Bret Hart. Uh, for that answer, I feel like would be the best technical wrestlers of all time. His next question, what are your thoughts on Daniel Bryan facing backstage heat because he is not protecting himself in the ring? So Daniel sent me a link to that article last week, and I thought it was complete bullshit. I think it's just uh, dirt cheap BS, which is not always the case, but I feel like in this case it is because, you know, the whole heat or the whole conversation, controversy surrounding the Sheamus match a couple of weeks ago on SmackDown, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Sheamus was not rough. That's his 
you know, typical in-ring style, so I don't see why people thought he was rough or beating up Daniel Bryan. And the fact that he wasn't protecting himself in the ring, like, it was a, it was an accident. Shit happens when people get busted open was, you know, Brock Lesnar, was he not protecting himself at WrestleMania? Like, they pick and choose who they want to heat on, if true, anyway. If true, it's obviously a case of they just do not like Daniel Bryan. I've said that before on Facebook and on Twitter and whatever, that they just have it out for Daniel Bryan, and that's probably the reason why, but... I'd probably put my money on this just being bullshit. People just making shit up um, because it, it's ridiculous. Why would you know? Why would there be heat on him from not protecting himself? It's not like you know he goes out there like a madman. The guy does protect himself more often than not. He doesn't get busted open every single week, so it's ridiculous. But um, yeah, I think it's just a garbage report is all. His next question: Do you think that Hideo Itami can make it on the main roster with him not speaking, not yet speaking English, a hundred percent? Um, he will make it on the main roster eventually, of course, but like you said, not yet is his English perfected. Um, so he's not going to be called up anytime soon, nor should he. I think they have to wait until at least the end of the year, if not WrestleMania time next year. I think he'll be ready for And hopefully by that time, his mic skills will have improved. The guy's learned a lot of English. Like when I heard him talk in the NXT special last week, he was really, really good. And I thought he was, you know, he, he did well in, 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 in speaking English and whatever. But like you said, his English is not there yet. It should be by later this year this time next year. Um, and if not, worst case scenario, you give the guy a mouthpiece. I think that could be work just as well. Paul Heyman or whoever I think would you know, work wonders. The guy's entering ability speaks for itself, and he has a lot of charisma. He just needs to be able to talk. And if he has that mouthpiece, then that problem is solved. And his last question, um, would there be a chance for us to see a Daniel Bryan versus Brock Lesnar match? And if it happens, what stipulation would you add? I think there is a chance of it happening now. I mean, Brock Lesnar will be around for the next three years, and hopefully they don't waste those three years on constant rematches between, you know, Lesnar and Cena and Lesnar and Triple H, like we saw in his previous two runs. Um, hopefully we get some fresh matches out of, out of Brock Lesnar this run. And we already have one. One against Roman Reigns, the first young guy, aside from CM Punk, since 2012 that Lesnar has worked with. And the match is phenomenal. And I'm looking forward to him, you know, wrestling either Reigns again or... Rollins at SummerSlam or a triple threat or whatever, I think it'd be excellent. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but um, yeah, I think there is a chance. I think Daniel Bryan, although he is mid card right now, like I've said before, and it's not going to happen, like if Brock Lesnar won back the championship for SummerSlam um, and then he was a champion going into SummerSlam or is champion at SummerSlam or something like that, and Bryan holds the belt until that pay per view or WrestleMania or whatever and pulls an Ultimate Warrior in merging both the IC. I know Triple H did it too, but Ultimate Warrior was the only one in history to merge the both belts, mer merge both the IC and World Championship belts in being Intercontinental Champion. I know Triple H was the World Champion when he did it, so Warrior is the only one to be able to do that. Um, if he were to beat Lesnar, I know a lot of people say it might not be believable, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't even have to win. Um, maybe, in that, maybe, in that, maybe in that scenario he would, but um, for Lesnar anyway, I feel like the match could be phenomenal. A lot of people, like I said, do not think it'd be believable. But you look at his match with CM Punk at SummerSlam. Was it not believable? Maybe to an extent, but the match was kick-ass. I thought that was the best match of 2013. I love watching it back. It was an excellent matchup. Now, some people say they couldn't suspend their disbelief. I get it, but you take that away. I thought the match from an in-ring standpoint, I said going into it, it would be great. And I still think now that it was one of, if not the best match of 2013. I feel like you can get that same kind of match with the Bryan against Lesnar. So there is a chance of it happening. Chances of it happening, are they high? Definitely not, because Bryan is not at that level. But if he does get back to main event um, status at some point, then um, he will hopefully you know, regain that championship. Um, he will be able to go one-on-one -on -one with Brock Lesnar, and there will be a chance of it happening. So I would not completely count it out. There is a, there is a, the, the odds of it happening are not high, but... Don't completely count it out. And the stipulation, if it were to happen, like I said, I like the idea of a champion versus champion match with Brock Lesnar being the world champion and Brian being the intercontinental champion. Um, but aside from that, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be like no holds barred. Like it could be. Like the punk match is no holds barred. They added the stipulation like that net on the show on the kickoff show or something like that. And the match is phenomenal. So that's only the really thing that I would add. I mean, it doesn't need to be an Iron Man match or a submission match or something like that. It's fucking worthless, you know? So, you know, just keep it straight up singles or no holds barred, I feel like, would make for the best match between those two. At Cody Collier, 37, his question was, um, this pertains to Raw tonight, so if you're watching this after the fact, then you already know the answer to this question, but do you think we'll see Paige win the Battle Royal on Raw since Raw is in, her, in the UK, and do you see her winning the championship? I didn't even think about that. I mean, right now, I thought, I mean, you know, everyone's been thinking this for weeks, that, um... 
it'll be Paige. I mean, it, it'll be Naomi winning the Battle Royal. I mean, she's already beat the champ twice, so for her to beat the champion and not get the title shot makes absolutely no sense. And then they have her, unless they have her in a triple threat match with Nikki and Paige or whoever. But I completely forgot about the fact, I mean, I like I said at the start of the show, I know that Raw is in England tonight, but I didn't put two, to, two together and think that there was a chance that Paige could win, especially considering she never, I mean, she did get a rematch in Raw for the title, but um, she never, uh, I don't know why she, she was cheated out of it, because the dissension the, the between her and AJ was what cost her the championship. So um, she never really got the, we never really got the ending of that feud, I guess you could say, so I'd be fine with them doing a rematch. And if they do a stipulation, I mean, it would have to be a stipulation. Match. We've already seen Paige versus Nikki a couple times. They would need to add a stipulation of some sort. But I think Naomi is the best person to go with. It's a fresh match. I know we've seen it a few times before in singles competition over the years. But um, it's something new compared to Paige and Nikki. You know what I mean? So I'd be fine with Naomi contending for that championship. Come Extreme Rules, the match could be really, really good. And if she wins, that'd be amazing. I could see Paige contending for the title but not winning. Uh, if only because we've already seen her as champion twice before in the last year. She'll get the belt back at some point. For right now, though, they should focus on building up new names. Paige is already established. She does not need that belt championship. She does not need that belt back right now. So building up Naomi as a uh, potential challenger and champion would be great in my opinion. So last two questions come from at Swagzio. Their question was, uh, first of two, are there, me are there too many stables in TNA right now? Right now, I mean, I think we have the Rising. We have the A's, not the A's, the, the uh, fucking... Um, what do they even call it? The Beatdown Clan. Is there another stable? I don't feel like there is, aside from the Menagerie, but they're never on TV, the Bromance. Um, I don't know if they have too many stables right now, but I've said time and time again, the stables, the infatuation with stables in TNA needs to fucking stop. Like, there has not been a, a time, there has not been a period in TNA history in at least the last five or six, seven, eight years in which we did not have a stable of some sort. If it's not the main event mafia, then it's fucking immortal. If it's not immortal, then it's Fortune, who I loved, but in terms of heel factions. And if it wasn't Fortune, it was Aces and Eights. If it's not Aces and Eights, it's the Beatdown Clan. I mean, we can never go a good while without having some sort of faction or heel authority figure. WWE is guilty of it too, but they're not as obsessive over factions as much as TNA is. I mean, it's ridiculous. I love TNA. I'm not shitting on the product. In a way, I am. But um, I, I want to see them do well, but the factions need to stop. The Beatdown Clan is not as bad as the Aces and Eights were, because the Aces and Eights was made up com of complete goofs, people that did not mean anything, people that, that the crowd did not give two shits about. And after losing every single fucking week, why should I care about them, you know? So at least with the, the Beatdown Clan, they've been booked a little bit better. They have a lot of good members in there. That makes sense. Kenny King, and MVP, um, who else is in there? Homicide, I know, and Caval, low-key, whatever. And I know Samoa Joe just left. And Eric Young, I don't really count, but whatever. I don't really care about the amount of stables they have in TNA right now, but the obsessive compulsion with, the, with, with stables, period, in TNA needs to fucking end. Healer face, I don't care. The Rising is not doing it for me right now. I really like Galloway, do not really care much for the other two, but the anti-WWE, like, we're going to speak our voice, is so CM Punk-esque, is so, you know, like, we're bashing our former employer, which is anything but the case, excuse me, when it comes to McIntyre, like, you hear him in interviews, like, I want to work there again, then why on TV are you, you know, indirectly bashing the company, you know, it's not because I'm a WWE mark, but because we've seen this shit time and time again, you know, with TNA and, and their stables and saying, oh, I want to stick it to the man. Like, you can do that. EC3 is a prime example of a guy that got shafted in WWE. And he's not cutting promos in TNA saying, oh, they, you know, they skipped over me, whatever. He just doesn't even acknowledge it. He just goes out there and does his shit. You know, you don't have to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, fuck them. I'm going to do this for me. Whatever. Don't, you don't even need to say that. You know, keep it to yourself and then just prove them wrong. That's what EC3 is doing. That's what they should be doing with the rising. I don't blame those three guys. I blame the booking and then, you know, given material that they say every single week and material that we've seen, we've heard for years from TNA. The whole anti WWE thing. We're different. We're an alternative. Cool. Be an alternative. You don't need to say you're an alternative. We get it if you are. You know what I mean? So last question. If Samoa Joe went to WWE, do you think he would be used correctly? So good question ended off, but um, I've talked about this before. Samoa Joe is great and amazing talent, has a lot of potential. And I mean, when the rumors first, you know, were swirling, is he going to go to WWE? I didn't think it was even possible. And they already proved me wrong in that. It's not official yet, but it's pretty much confirmed it's likely that he's going to show up in WWE sooner rather than later in NXT, whatever. So that being said, 
Um, I feel like under Triple H's advisement, he will be used right. I mean, I didn't think Kevin Owens would be, you know, as good as he is right now. I know the guy is great, but I didn't think WWE would, you know, showcase him as a star in Triple H with NXT being his baby. They have done that properly in the last, you know, few months or so when he first arrived in, in, in TNA back in December. So hopefully with, you know, Samoa Joe being another pet project of Triple H, who does not more often than not give up on his pet projects as much as like Vince does and people like that. Like they will push Sheamus and then they'll get bored of him like a week later. Like Fondang got the same thing with Vince. He'll get he'll get a fetish for pushing these guys, like an odd gimmicks like an Adam Rose or Fondango or the New Day. Then he just fucking gives up like the next week, you know? It's ridiculous. At least Triple H is more often than not is not the case with him. So I do have faith he will be used right in WWE. Will he be world champion? Remains to be seen. I think he could be. But a match against uh, matches against Brock and Cena and Orton and all these other people, Roman Reigns maybe even, all these other guys, uh, Daniel Bryan and Seth Rollins would be phenomenal. Um, you know, matches against those kind of guys would be great. I think those could really prove his worth as a top-tier star in WWE if he's allowed to fully showcase his skills and reach his full potential in the WWE. So that's going to do it for Hashtag Ask You Some here today. As always, guys, thank you so much for sending the questions. Always appreciate it. If you want to send in a question, you can tweet me on Twitter at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask You Some. Find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. And you can also find me right here on YouTube. Make sure to leave a comment down below, and I'll be sure to include your question in next week's video. So as always, make sure to share, comment, like, and subscribe. All support is greatly appreciated. Enjoy, enjoy Raw in England tonight. It's going to be a great show. And if you're already watching this after Raw or whatever, have a great week. And I'll catch you guys next Monday.